Good morning, church. My name is Evan. I'm the teaching pastor. It is good to be with you this morning. Hey, everybody watching online as well, we're so thankful that you've joined together to worship with your church family. This is week two of our series, The Church You've Always Wanted to Be. And we really wanted there to be a pause there between the church you've always wanted and to be. Because it's, it's easy for us to kind of imagine or think about, man, I wish church was like this or this or this. Let me find a church that has this or this or this. But when we think about how we are invited to create that community, to be that community, it gets a little more difficult. This series, we are looking at the book of Malachi. It's the last book of the Old Testament. The people of God had been in exile for a long time. They have just returned to their homeland. They're back home. And you would think that after going through such a crisis together, that they might have learned something. What we discover in the book of Malachi is that they have not learned much. That they have been quick to fall back into old rhythms and challenges and practices. So we're reading from Malachi for this series because... It's been a year of crisis for us. Even two weeks ago, we got a new one with ice and power and all of those challenges. Some of us still dealing with big effects from those crises. But as we emerge and vaccines start to roll out, what kind of church are we going to be? This is a chance for us to imagine together what God may be calling us to be all about. This is a chance for us to learn from the people of God in the past and hopefully imagine a way forward that does not repeat all the mistakes that they made. So we're going to listen and learn from the dangers that they fell into as we read these dialogues between God and his people. Last week we talked about the church we've always wanted to be as loving In the coming weeks, we'll talk about things as as difficult as, as marriage issues, as indifference towards the injustice around the community. But before we get there, we find that Malachi wanted us first to realize that God is concerned with his love for us, and God is concerned with how we worship. That God is concerned with our relationship towards him And then he'll begin to think about how we think about our relationship with others. We will see that the people of God here have really missed it when it comes to worship. We'll discover that the church we've always wanted to be is a church that is sacrificial. Now I know you hear that word sacrifice and you may get a little nervous, I know. It's not a word that we really like to talk about, especially after the year that we've had. You're like, sacrifice? (laughs) You want me to give up something else, really? We hate sacrifice because it it seems like an, an obligation, a box to check, a requirement. You know, like taxes. We hate taxes. But we see today that sacrifice is not just penance or some kind of obligation, No, instead, sacrifice is a loving response to love received. The people of Israel practice their worship often with sacrifice. And while we may not worship in exactly the same way, we as God's people are called, as Paul says, to be living sacrifices, that our whole lives would be a sacrifice to God. Our worship is, both on Sunday morning and how we live throughout the week, is to be marked by sacrifice. We say around here, worship is saying, I love you back to God. The people of Israel have shifted away from worshiping God because they love him and they're just worshiping because they feel like they have to. They've come out of a crisis and now they're just going through the motion. They've lost their sense of wonder and awe of the power and goodness of God. So we'll read first in Malachi chapter 1. We'll start in verse 6. Malachi 1, verse 6. This is God speaking to his people. A son honors his father, 
and servants their master. If then I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. You say, how have we despised your name by offering polluted food on my altar? We'll pause there. God says, where is the honor, the respect due to me? We hear those words and we may not be sure exactly what God means by those. I want to break those down a little bit. Honor here is a really interesting word in the biblical language. It, it also comes, it means honor, of course, but it also comes from a, a word that has to do with heaviness and weight. See, the, the word honor means to take something very seriously. You know, to give a rip about it. So in Scripture, when, when the text says to honor your mother and father, it doesn't just mean like some kind of blind obedience. It means take incredibly serious what they have to say. God says, where is my honor? And that is a sense of, do you even care? Now the word respect here, it means awe, to be captivated by, to be in wonder of. God says, you no longer seem to take me very seriously. You're no longer in wonder or in awe of who I am. One scholar says it like this. Sacrifice is a loving response to love received. When duty replaces devotion, however, human nature is such that it seeks the minimum steps, barely enough to meet the obligation. This contrasts with a true love relationship seeking to do the maximum for their beloved. Israel, and in particular her priests, are seen here having lost their first love. So the people of God have now seen their relationship with God, their worship of God as an obligation, not as a true love relationship. This happens in lots of our relationships, this shift to just an obligation. Right? It happens in our, in our marriages, now I can think about uh, all the date nights that I planned and, and all the hoops that I went through to try to win my wife's affection. And I remember pretty early in our marriage, she said to me, man, we haven't gone on a date in forever. And I was kind of taken aback because I was like, uh, on Friday, we went out to eat together. And she was like, you said, hey, do you want to go get some food? And we went out to eat together. That is not a date. And this was news to me. I thought that that qualified, right? And so, uh, this is something that with husbands, I don't know. We're like, uh, we went in, uh, uh, there, there, there was a waiter. Somebody got us things. This is a date, right? <laughs> Apparently not. Because no longer was there this sense of desire to do this great thing. The very act of the planning was so important to my wife because it showed this sense of, of caring, of giving a rip ahead of the time, just not being hungry and not feeling like cooking. <laughs> we do this in our relationships. I mean, I used to write, write my wife poetry, and now I'll like text her, hey, what's up? <laughs> right? God is saying, where is the wonder and the awe? Don't you remember what we have? Don't you remember what I've done for you? Perhaps that's a word that we need to hear today. For those of us who've been in a relationship with God a long, long time, we, we can forget about date nights. We can forget about the wonder and the goodness, the beauty, the lengths that God goes to for us, his power. We do this with God. I do it with God. I have a lot of years of theological education. I've spent a lot of time in the scriptures. It can become a chore for me. I can dissect it and break the words down and forget 
that this is a message from the God of the universe for me and for us. Prayer can become just a task. Gathering to worship a a chore, our sacrifice turns into just an obligation and we might try to do the bare minimum rather than respond to God with our very best. This is a problem. It's a problem in our our culture. It's a problem in uh, church culture. Uh, The National Study of Youth and, and Religion found that American young people are theoretically fine with religious faith, but they say it does not concern them very much, that it is not durable enough to survive long after they graduate high school. Now before you say, yeah, kids these days, I want us to think about how they may have learned this, what kind of faith they may have received. What have we modeled for our young people with our, the way that we think about church and worship, and sacrifice? Have we modeled a faith that concerns them because it concerns us? Have we shown them that it matters? Have we demonstrated our awe? There's this statistic uh, about raising children. Um, It kind of blows my mind, and it says, the strongest uh, predictor of a strong relationship between an adult child and their parents is that from a young age they had a sense of their family's story. That their parents were open and told them about their story and their journey and thus fostered this deep relationship that would last. Have we been honest about our stories? And as I think about the church, I wonder if we have demonstrated enough to others the awe of the story of God in our lives? Have we sacrificed some comfort? Have we sacrificed some of what we like to do, some of our sense of having it all figured out to share our story in the awe of God with others? I want to challenge you to to seek out that sense of awe and wonder with God. This series, we're, we're encouraging you to take some time every day to appreciate something in nature. Some of us connect really well to God in nature. That is not how I am wired, but it is the way that my wife is wired. She uh, loves to improve things and, and make things get better, and then she goes out into nature, and there's not much you can improve about God's creation. And so she can be still and in awe. So I want to encourage you to go spend some time every day and find something that you can just be in awe about and remember what God has done for you. As we look at this text, you may have some objections. In verse 6, six uh, the Lord says, where is the respect that is due to me, O priests? And you say, yeah, for priests. It's not about me. Evan, shouldn't you be preaching this to a mirror? Why, are, why do y'all bring us into it? Yes, it is just for priests. I have news for you. You are Christians. And because we are Christians, as we find in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you, all of you, may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Yeah, this is a message for priests. And that means you. Now, this does not mean that that Joe and I or the other ministers get off the hook, okay? This is a serious passage, and one day we will stand before the Lord, and he's going to ask us about how we led all of you. And nobody takes that more seriously than us. I've been chewing on this text all week. But all of you are priests. When we follow Jesus, we become priests. And so you lead. You lead all over in your workplaces, in your homes, with your families, in your relationships, in the places you go, the ways you serve here in the church. Just being here, you're leading. The researchers who found that American young people say that faith doesn't generally concern them also found that the churches who are doing best at reaching young people 
focus not so much on getting everything right, but they focus on Jesus and his awe-inducing story. They share that story again and again. The church we want to be sacrifices some of our own pride and our comfort and takes God, his character, and his scripture seriously and stands in awe. There is another danger that emerges from this Malachi passage, and it is one where we might just give God good enough, where we might just turn to God and give God the leftovers. And I have to tell you, sacrifice is not sacrifice if it doesn't cost anything. In every area of our life, the temptation is to just give God good enough, the minimum. I want to read Malachi 1, uh, 7 through 8. The priest asked, and how, how have we despised your name? And the Lord says, by offering polluted food on my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you offer those that are lame and sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. See, so the priests are offering sacrifices from the leftovers, from the animals that they have no use for, from the worst that they had. See, God has commanded that our sacrifices be from the best, that we give the best that we have, and instead they're giving what was convenient, what wouldn't hurt, what wouldn't be missed, what didn't cost them anything. I brought a picture uh, from one of our partners. This is Helping Hands Ministry in Belton. Uh, They are a nonprofit food pantry and resource center, and this is their back dock. That door opens up and that's their warehouse where they keep all their food. So trucks back up there to deliver the food that they can give. It's a great place. You can volunteer. They're doing curbside groceries right now. I'd encourage you to volunteer. They do not accept donations back here. (laughs) They have signs that says we do not accept donations and no dumping. And yet this is a normal site. Stuff just dumped. Can you imagine the person who's like, yeah, this broken hat rack. They need this. I will donate it and feel so good about myself. We do that, though. We think, yeah, this, I have no use for this. I could give it to God, and then I could feel good. I gave something to God. As we think about the throne room of the Lord and the things that we bring to God, what does it look like? What does our sacrifice look like to God? What are we bringing for God's work in the world? Does it look like that? Sacrifice should be a loving response to love received. And when duty replaces devotion, however, human nature is such that it seeks the minimum steps, barely enough to meet an obligation. This contrasts with the true love relationship, seeking to do the maximum for the beloved. Duty has replaced devotion. God looks at these sacrifices and says, you wouldn't give this to your governor. You would not give this to your boss. (laughs) And this is what you bring me? What are we bringing to the Lord? When we come to worship here, what are we bringing? Are we coming just to consume or to participate in what God is doing in our midst? I'll tell you, as a pastor, when I go to worship somewhere else, when I'm worshiping and not preaching, It can be really tempting for me to not fully engage with the worship and instead to just like pick it apart. Like, oh, I would do that differently or that doesn't work or that didn't make sense. Are we coming to critique or to create? Are we coming and worshiping with our lives out of a sense of commitment or out of convenience? I'll admit it's easy for me to go through the motions. I know what to do. But when I think about those whose faith have shaped me the most, there was no going through the motions. I think about the youth leader who encouraged me to share and teach from my story and the scripture to other students, and I think about the terrible messages he must have endured as he helped shape me. 
I think about the professor whose office I went to when I was having like a crisis of what I might do with my life and he sat with me. I'm sure while he had deadlines looming, listened, gave advice, helped me define and discover the call that God had put in my life. I think about the dean of my seminary who after I graduated, we faced a crisis and something going on in our church and he called me on my cell phone and just walked me through. He listened and gave advice. These people sacrificed their time, their energy. They did it for God and it shaped me. Helped me imagine the kind of church I want to be. So as we think about where we've been and imagine where we're going, what kind of church do we want to be on the other side of crisis? Malachi in chapter 2, starting in verse 4, reminds the people about how things used to be, the ideal of what it looks like for the leaders following God. He says this in Malachi 2, 4, Know then that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi, that is the priest, may hold, says the Lord's of hosts. My covenant with him was a covenant of life and well-being, which I gave him. And because of this good covenant, this called for reverence. He revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in integrity and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. God says, this is what it can look like. For reverence, that is honor that we mentioned at the beginning, taking this Jesus thing seriously. For awe, that is respect, that is remembering who God is and what God has done for us. This will lead us to true instruction of the lips of our leaders, to walking with God in integrity, uprightness, and then transformation happening in our community. Malachi says, look, this is not happening amongst you anymore, but it can again with a little honor and a little respect. When we live in a way that takes God and his word seriously, that's why we've encouraged you to read the book of Matthew together as a church. Those reading guides are available online. They're available in some printouts out there. We'd love to invite you to read the scripture, to engage with it. To not give in to some temptation and make it something else, something easier, something that aligns with what you already think, but be shaped by it, respect it, honor it. When we live this way, we live differently, and it will lead those around us away from wrong living. It will lead those far from God to encounter him and grow in the ways of Christ. It will lead us to encounter God and grow in the ways of Christ. Now, this message is not meant to to beat us up, to give us more obligations to do, but to remind us of who God is and what he desires for us, that the standard he has for us is high because we can reach it, that he wants us to be the church we've always wanted to be. He has made you for great things, powerful things, deep impact in this world, He has wired you for it, to be his people, to point to his light, to celebrate and live with awe and honor. He's that good. Will it take work? Of course. It takes sacrifice. And there's cost there, but it's who we can be. So I want to give you two homework assignments about sacrifice. Here's the first one. I really want to challenge you to do this. Someone's already set up an appointment with me to do this. Uh, I want you to ask somebody about their faith journey, and I want you to share yours. Not somebody that you know super well, you've already had this conversation with, maybe maybe not even somebody in our church. Ask them to share their faith journey and share yours with them as well. When I do this with people, I'm always just so encouraged, and the spark of the awe of God is always lit again when I hear what God has done in someone else's story. 
And then I get to share mine and remember what God has done in mine. So I want to encourage you to do that this week. Find somebody and do that. Your second piece of homework is some prayer and reflection. I I want you to ask God to reveal what you have that is best. What has God given you that is the finest thing that God has given you? And it's not necessarily a material thing. It probably isn't. Maybe it's finances, but maybe it's some other gifting, some other talent, some relationship, some energy. What do you value? Pray that God would reveal what it is that he wants you to give away from. Give some of it away. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you don't pull any punches here with your people. And it's not because you're mad, but it's because you know the potential. Because you know what can happen when your church lives sacrificially. And so God, I pray that in each of us, you would remind us of your goodness and your love. That the sacrifice you are inviting to is not something you wouldn't do yourself. In fact, you laid down your life for us, sacrificing all for us. How might we respond to this love? God, you have gifted this church with much. And as we emerge from crisis and continue to walk and hope and dream, may you reveal to us what it is you're calling us to sacrifice. Not as some kind of obligation or duty, but as a response to love received. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.